the Humble Hour is here once again. And with the magic of editing, we forgot to put something in at the very start of the episode. So here we are. Yes, Brian, here we are. And we have some news about our live show, which we have been talking a little bit about over the last couple of weeks. It was originally scheduled for the 23rd of April, but due to some scheduling conflicts, we're switching things around a little bit. We're giving you all and our guests and ourselves a little bit more time. So we're rescheduling for the 7th of May, Sunday, the 7th of May at 8 o'clock Central European time. It's going to be our celebration of passing the 200 episode mark for the Uninformed Handball Hour. And we have two brilliant guests confirmed already. Yahia Omar of Telecom Vesprem and Egypt fame. And Eduarda Amarim, the multiple Champions League winner, world champion with Brazil. Two of the guests confirmed so far and we're hoping to confirm a few more already that'll be live on zoom exclusively for our patreon fans so you sign up on patreon and you'll be able to join us and join our guests live on zoom and get involved if you want to Uh, we'll figure out some ways to make it entertaining for you all live on zoom And we will, of course, release the podcast at a later date for everybody else. But if you want to listen to it live on Sunday, make sure to sign up for our Patreon now. You can just search for Handball Hour and Patreon in Google and it will pop up there. Anything else you want to say, Alex? Just just want to thank everyone who has signed up for our Patreon again. uh, We do appreciate your support. It's, It's helped us bring exciting stuff like this live show on Zoom. Uh, but it is uh, we're excited about it uh, we're gonna have some guests that, that we will announce very very soon um some of our patrons have already signed up for the live show so it's just you know it's three dollars a month to sign up you can also do it for as much as you want so one dollar whatever follow the links on our socials to get onto our patreon page then you can join the show and enjoy all the extra bonus content as well so Thank you, everyone. It's it's been a wild ride. Let's let's make it wilder. <laughs> One dollar, you really get into the America stuff already. Okay, I think we now can roll the music. Hello, handball friends. Welcome to another episode of the Uniformed Handball Hour. I think it was around this time last year that we had our first venture into a podcast without Chris O'Reilly uh, joining us. So today it's just the what we call us the bad brothers i don't know why do we don't have a nickname yet but uh the bad brothers uh, just makes us well, what sound we... like we are bad at podcasting as opposed to badass <laughs> but I, I hope <laughs> well it's not, it's not it's not untrue is it i don't know but it's uh, of course me brian campion joined by alex coolish all the way over the other side of the atlantic how's that uh, life that's uh, good how's your life since you made the big move yeah, it's good i'm uh I'm up at the crack of dawn for this one, but uh, it's something I'll get used to. That's something. But I have to say, it's been it's been yeah. lovely on the weekends. Just the handball games that happen on the weekends are just early in the morning. So you wake up, you get your bit of coffee, and then on the couch, and then there's some beautiful handball on, like the German Cup, the Bundesliga, the French League. So I've been getting a lot of that in. So that that's been nice. Yeah, that is nice as well because I've often found as well some games you want to watch, but it kind of does often then clash with your with your evening plans. So you're you're in the perfect time zone for that for getting in the morning, and you can still have a life as well. It's not going to completely dominate your social life. But um, so we're going to talk today about a few different things, and our, probably the main thing is that we do have a, a very nice guest coming up at the end of the episode. We Javi Sabata of Płock, formerly of Vesprem, formerly of the Hungarian national team, and also currently now coaching the Czech national team, who had a very good results against Iceland recently. So he had a lot to say about the current setup in Płock, about their big win over Nantes, which is, I think was unexpected for a lot of people, and their huge game or quarterfinal against 
SC Magdeburg, which if they won that, that would be a real, real feather in their cap. And of course, then head on to the final four in Cologne, which would be absolutely sensational. So I think we're all fans here of Płock. Never mind the the one the one fire that we tweeted out a while ago. We are we are of course big fans of uh, of the Płock getup. Um, what what have you made of their their season so far, Alex? It's just it's been great to see this team develop. Um, I, I think a couple of years back, even with Xavi Sabate at, at the helm, Plotsk were a little bit of a laughing stock on this podcast, or at least we, it was a butt of a few jokes in terms of their squad, how they're a bunch of old dudes that got together. But now it's just a, it's a team that works. They have a great system and they have some fantastic players. And all of that is a testament to Xavi Sabate's work. Uh, I think. A quarterfinal is a surprise for them uh, coming into the Champions League after a couple of years out, and it, we we won't say that's that's where they'll end. You know, they have a real opportunity of a final four place, which at the start of the season and even through the group stage is not something we would have really banked on. Uh, again, gr- great work there, and it's just seeing them replicate the form that we've seen in the Polish league where they're just challenging Kielsa every single time they're neck and neck and I think we were a little bit disappointed in the group stage with plots because they they didn't seem to be showing that level of performance but they have it on the big days and probably you know the way their league is set up they're you know they're set up for these huge kind of knockout in uh, in inverted commas games against Kielsa where everything is on the line. So they know how to play in these big games and they showed that against Nantes. So yeah, definitely a great chat with Xavi coming up. Probably the most exciting handball that has happened over the last week or so is the German Cup final where Ryan Necker Leuven are German Cup champions. Who would have who would have thought that would happen just just a season ago? Yeah, I mean like I think probably just the best way to start with this is to say, I mean, what an absolutely incredible job Sebastian Heinze has done since he came in. To think that they were in the 2021 season, fifth, and then the season after that, uh, tenth, to now him pulling it all together and then lifting a German Cup. And they were sitting on top of the Bundesliga there for a while. I mean, their form has dropped off a little bit, but they turned up for this weekend, all guns blazing. And I mean, they absolutely blew away um, Flensburg in the semi final. Flensburg had absolutely no chance to look like in a different league completely. And I think he's 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 really instilled. He's you can see that players have really really bought into what he's trying to do here. And I tell you, I love it. I mean, not sure it's the type of handball that's going to win you a league often because it's really like high risk, high reward. But it's great stuff for cup handball. And if they can somehow get back into the Champions League as well, I think it'd be very, very entertaining stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they did it in style because they, they have been in a real rut. They, they lost four games in a row after looking like the, you know, informed team this season in Bundesliga. They lost four games in a row and pretty much got knocked out of contention for the league title, definitely probably a Champions League spot. But this weekend, they they just had something about them. And they were clearly the better team against both Flensburg, who were on this 23-game unbeaten run, and Magdeburg, who have just you know dominated everyone this season, or at least looked incredible this season. And over both games, it was Rydnick and Leuven who were clearly the better team and their defense was just out of this world the it was so aggressive and first against Flensburg they really had they couldn't get through them at all and then in that final against Magdeburg which I'll have to go through the insanity that happened in that final against Magdeburg where they Again, Ryan Nickelovin were the better team the whole game. It was just this Magdeburg never say die attitude that kept them in the game. But they were the better team and deserved the win after penalties um, at the end. So 31-31 after extra time, 27-27 at full time, then 31-31. And then just one penalty missed, as has been the case 
a lot over the last few penalty shootouts we've seen. It does come down to that one penalty miss. Um, and Ryan ne- Neckerlewin took the cup home. It's it incredible. But that final, oh, it was out of this world. Oh, it was really out of this world. And I, like... I mean, you have to you have to just say like Yuri Kinnor is just the best man for that type of system that they've set up there. I mean, he you mentioned it during the Euro as well that he's just the best guy at just standing shots. He's so unbelievable hiding behind defenders and the keeper doesn't know where he is and then just unleashing the shots. And I was listening to to uh, the the German commentary and they were talking about how Sebastian Heinze has talked about in interviews how he likes to kind of encourage risk taken a lot of the times and he, he kind of he doesn't he'll never hammer someone for taking a shot that maybe might have been in other people's books a little bit too early and Yuri Kinor is just the perfect man for that system because he'll just pull off a shot that you think it's not coming now and all of a sudden he's just whip, with, with his arm standing and just whipping one in and the backcourt looks really good that that trio that backcourt with um Lager again on the right, Yuri Kinnor in the centre, and then uh, Nielsen on the left. He looks almost a lot, lot more of a mature player than what he used to be. He used a bit of a random rocket back in the day as well. But there was one, there was one situation in the semi final where he absolutely he made the the Flensburg defence look like absolutely he pulled them all right over. <laughs> They're all just falling right over, and with uh, callback on the line with about five meters of space on his own, it was absolutely beautiful. People were losing their minds, but uh, a, a, bit, a bit of a masterclass, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it it all came down to just pure chaos. So the last minutes and extra time were just pure chaos. So again, Ryan Eklivan were pretty much ahead for most of the game. But Magdeburg just kind of started to get into the game in the second half, started coming back and made it pretty much level. And it looked like Magdeburg had momentum because uh christiansen who had a quiet first half he he was only shooting like 40 percent, i think uh two from five and it was really being shut down by the defense he just came alive in the second half and dragged this magdeburg team and it looked like it, it was magdeburg that were gonna romp home but with uh two minutes 30 seconds left is when all of the chaos started so, two minutes, 30 seconds left. Ryan Nicolivan worked the ball out to the right wing. And somehow, I think Matthias Muscha stepped out to try to get an interception. It was Chris Janssen that went across towards the right wing and pretty much stepped under Grudzki's foot. Oh, no, it was Kirk Luka shooting from the wing. Uh, stepped under his foot. Two minutes for Chris Janssen. Penalty for Ryan Nicolivan to go one goal ahead with two and a half minutes left. And you're thinking, this is it. This is, you know, Magdeburg's Mr. Clutch is gone. Reinick Levin have a penalty to seal this um, victory and romp home with a player advantage. But that just didn't happen. So <laughs> Reinick Levin did, did score that penalty, made it 27-26. Uh, then... Magdeburg came back and scored. Uh, Smiths made it 27-27. Reinick Levin then missed a free shot from, from the wing and uh, the ball came back to to Magdeburg with 30 seconds left. And in, in that last attack, Chris Janssen was back on the pitch and this time it's Callbacker that gets the two minutes and gives away a penalty for Magdeburg to win with seven seconds left. Was it not Yuri, Yuri Knorr tackling them? No, I thought. I thought it was Yuri Knorr, but maybe, maybe I remember him wrong. I thought it was Yuri Knorr on Christensen. It was Callbacker that got the two minutes, and then it was Yuri Knorr, you're right, for. Uh, so then Ryan Nicklund were down to four players, four outfield players for that final penalty. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it was just all out, because it ended up being six against five in that final attack for Magdeburg. And Chris Janssen just broke through straight past uh, Ola Shefford. Sorry. Oh, God. Getting, it was just too much chaos. Too much to... <laughs> but <laughs> she, you're right. Shefford and Knorr just look exactly the same. And they actually play the same position at times. So it, it does get confusing with those ponytails. Um, yeah, it does, yeah. But 
Kai Smith stepped up, who had he's had a fantastic season, had a fantastic game, but he didn't know he was coming up against 20-year-old David Spade in the goal of Ryan McIlwain, their third goalkeeper, who I don't even know why he got a chance because, you know, Beerlem was having a good game. They have Applegren, mm-hmm. who is a tried-and-tested ch- veteran. But in those last minutes, Sebastian Hinze just thought, I'm putting on this wild card. And that wild card's name was David Spaeth. And he saved the penalty from Kai Smith's with seven seconds to go, or it ended up being four seconds left after the ball went out. It was incredible. And David Spade continued. So we went to extra time. David Spade continued to be a monster. He basically saved all four first shots that he faced in the game, including two seven-meter penalties in and the one the spin shot from the wing was was the most impressive one because like that was not accidental by any means like he he went down to meet that ball right, right um i can't remember who was shooting from the wing which is it um a uh, horka yeah i think it, i think it might have been and he he just went down to meet the ball it was an absolutely incredible save and i was thinking this guy's absolutely on fire and i was thinking the same thing when he came on as well i was like where did this guy come from and like, I mean, Heinze was a youth, a youth coach as well. And he's that bit of chaos in as well. Just throwing a young lad on like that. Like, but it was absolutely incredible performance. And he, he, I think your man, David Spade didn't know how to celebrate. He was just like, I felt like he was going to fucking burst out of his skin the way he was hopping around the place. He, did, he couldn't believe it himself, I think. I think so. But it, there was like this maturity from him as well. When we went into extra time, it, the camera panned to him and he was... He had this dead serious face and was pointing down, being like, everyone concentrate. We're here. Focus now. It's not over. Like, he's the yeah. big veteran in this squad and not this 20-year-old getting getting a wildcard chance. It's incredible. He continued that form, and that form led to Reinick Levin storming out ahead 30-27 in the first half of extra time. And I actually had a tweet written already being like, Congratulations to Ryan McLovin. You know, despite Magdeburg's uh, fight back, it, you know they they still went through. Congratulations to the champions, and they somehow managed to throw it away, throw away that three goal lead in the next five minutes, which included two miss saves, uh, two miss penalties from uh, Uwe Gensheimer. and it was just like, what what the hell is going on? Everyone's bottling it. But it's, it was, who wants to win this one? It was back and forth. Um, again, it came down to a penalty uh, at the very end, uh, which was scored by Magdeburg, right? Was that? Yeah, it was Kai Smith. I mean, the cojones on him to step up again after having missed the one that could have, I mean, that could have won it for them. And he steps up again and takes it and, and obviously scores this time then to bring it to penalties. Um but yeah, absolutely incredible. Who missed the penalty again? Oh, geez, I can't even remember. It, it, uh, was, it, was, uh, it was Chris Janssen who missed the penalty. It was Chris Janssen. It was Chris Janssen, that's right. Yeah, I mean, that's that's never easy. But I, I overall, I think Ryan Eckerlev were, were the better side. I felt like there was large parts of the game where Magdeburg were, were really holding in there. But you, you have to say hats off to them. I mean, they had a, they seemed like they had a different type of energy to all the other teams, especially in defense. You could see that in the semifinal, they were just like, it's like they were on testosterone or something compared to what uh, Flensburg looked like. How Flensburg look? Looked very lethargic, and you could probably you probably say the same thing. Like something like Gieselson was, I think, it was was incredible uh, for for them in both games. Yeah, very entertaining stuff. It was amazing. It, it was. Uh, I was just, I was just going wild, and it was it was like ten a.m. here, and I was shaking at <laughs> when the game finished. So I was like, oh god, I need to go back to bed. <laughs> Yeah, and it did all of this. I mean, when you when you were going into the games on the, before the semifinals, there was huge concerns about you know Patrick Grotsky was out and he's their captain and he was basically their only only right winger, and they were going to be playing these cup matches with no right wing, uh, who, which Nicholas Kerkeluk ended up playing. First goal of the whole of the whole uh, of the, the all, all the semifinals, Kirkeluk scores, kind of setting the tone for the whole weekend, and they didn't really miss and not having a right wing because the backer was just so good. And backcourt was so good and their fast break was so good. Like, it was just, who, who needs a right winger, you know? Yeah, that, that's it. Um, but did, did Grotsky play in the final at all? No, he didn't. No, no, it was, it was just, Kirk He was just there to lift the trophy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was just there to lift the trophy, yeah. Yeah, what 
what a performance. And, you know, Ryan Nicola really deserve something from this season. This performance they've put in over the whole season, this leap they've made as a team. And I think there's probably a lot of disappointment after that run of four losses in a row that they weren't expecting, that no one, none of us were expecting, really. I think Sasha Sat in our chat did say that he didn't believe in Ryan Nikolovin as real title challengers, but I don't think we expected such a collapse all, all at once. Um, but, you know, they deserve something from the season, and the German Cup is is a great prize for them. And you just you got to love knockout handball. Yeah, exactly. And I think it just suits maybe that their style of handball down to the ground as well. I mean, when you're conceding 42 goals at home to Gummer's back, I mean, there's something <laughs> that, that is a, that is a bit of a wild thing. It kind of kind of reminded me a little bit of Leeds United under Bielsa. Like, you know, it's like all gung-ho kind of football, but then the risk is you can get actually trounced when it doesn't work out. Like, um, But yeah, re- really, really great stuff. Um, really, really enjoyable I, I don't know what happened Flensburg to be honest because they really I, I, it looked like without Jim Godfreyson or someone that they needed someone like Jim to play and Jim is still obviously not at all uh, fit enough to play at that to, to, to play at that level at the moment and uh, they were doing everything to kind of make sure they were had good energy they got a charter flight down and everything from the south of Denmark <laughs> just to uh to to, to conser- conserve their energy, but it didn't. I mean, I mean, they looked they looked very lethargic when they, when they showed up for the semi final. So they'd be obviously disappointed. And for for Magdeburg, I think did you what did you, did you see Lemgo playing? I did. I didn't actually see too much of that game. I think um, Magdeburg were just the better team. So um, and then Flensburg did get the third place playoff. Good time now to mention just Montpellier's performance in the French Cup against PSG in one of the craziest games that I've ever seen in terms of just pure shock factor. I think the it was it was in Montpellier that there was a full crowd. People were going nuts, but it felt like everyone was in shock. Everyone was celebrating in a kind of way of like <clears throat> You see, so it's like, did you see this? I, what, what is, ah, oh, can you believe this? That kind of feeling, um, where they absolutely dominated PSG and won 33 20, a 13 goal win in the semi final of the Coupe de France. Um, they were just incredible. And Charles Balsinger, their new goalkeeping hope, and I called him, uh, Thierry Omier regen because he's already bald. So he's, he's going in and dominating in goal. Um, he had 14 saves in that game. He, he's an incredible talent against, uh, sporting. He only had one save from seven. So, um, not, not all rosy for the, he's, he's just 22 years old. Um, born in 2000, but already just an incredible player. But I just really like what Montpellier have done because Montpellier have been a little bit on the decline over the last little while. Um, they seem to be a bit lost as a, as a team and it almost seemed like they're losing ambition. And the big change they made is get Stas Scuba in. And I think he's just done wonders for that team because he's taken over that playmaker position. Diego Simone is still there, but they're able to really interplay quite well between each other. And they've gone away from that full reliance on Simone that they had over a couple of years as Simone kind of gradually declines into his older years. They brought in Scuba to be that boss in attack and they just, their younger players have also kind of stepped up. And I mentioned Balsinger being the you know the the star that he is the rising star that he is julian boss is a really really great player a weird player if you watch julian boss he's just this kind of lanky dude who plays a really direct style but i actually you know what he reminds me a little bit of a young brian campion <laughs> I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna, a left handed young <laughs> champion. He does this thing that I, I remember you used to do as well. It's like you go for the one on one, you know, the, maybe the arm over and you might get pushed back 
And you're like, nah, nah, I'm going again. And you just get past them on the second go. <laughs> that, that's a bit of Julian Boss. That's his style. It's like, no, nah, you, you, you got me once, but you're not going to get me twice. Um, so he, he's an exciting player. That's weird. I, I always really liked watching uh, Julian Boss. And I, I did think that myself, but I want to say <laughs> that because that would be so strange to say, like, he kind of looks like the way I used to play. But I did, I honestly did think that myself. But yeah, he's a, he, he's a really cool player, though, as well, because it's just something a little bit different about him to how normally right backs uh, conduct themselves. But uh, I love it. So, how much of a capitulation was it from PSG or just how good were Montpellier? Where would you kind of put that? I, th- I, I think it, yeah, it's, PSG just got punched in the face and couldn't stand up and it was a combination because the punch from Montpellier was really good you know they they were just lightning fast they wanted it more you had this like battle between the two tiny playmakers Steins and Scuba which was really really fun to watch and I think that the initial punch from Montpellier where they, they stormed into a seven goal lead in the first half. PSG just couldn't recover and Ballsinger just didn't let them recover. So it, the gap kept getting bigger because even the opportunities that Mon- um, PSG were getting, it, they were just getting shut out by Ballsinger. Um, it, it was just, it's great handball. To, to watch as well and Montpellier are you know in real contention of winning the the French league they're, they're top but they then the next week they dropped um they they lost to um Nantes by one goal in the league uh, which which kind of tied things up again so actually a, a little bit of a tough spell for this Montpellier team where they first they beat PSG and maybe they were too high and mighty after that. Uh, got a loss against Nantes and then a draw against uh, Sporting. But it, it may speak to their squad depth. I don't think they have the um, the depth that some of the really big clubs have. You know, they have a very good starting seven, but they're still you know relying on really good performances from their their top players or their goalkeeper. Kind of behind them, there's not as much as we see from the top clubs. So, you know, that is still a question mark for him. But I've just been really impressed by Montpellier and been really impressed by the, the French league as a whole. It's, it's really set up for a grandstand, um, finish. We have Montpellier on 42 points after 24 games, PSG on 42 points after 24 games and Nantes on 39 points after 23 games. So we're, you know, there's a real battle between those two, those three teams. And the, the great thing is, we, this, you know, a lot of teams below them have been able to kind of catch results from these top teams. Um, Toulouse being the, the primary culprit. So the French league is looking like it, it's really firing. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun between those top three teams. Every game that they've played this season has finished within one goal and to be honest i would i have them as favorites to win the european league even if it's on german soil as it always is uh, they are good enough and you know they've they've done it they've done a german soil in the champions league um where they've they've won in cologne before um so for me they they are still the favorites and would you have them as favorites for the cup as well the french cup so they're going to be playing out against nantes of course in the in the final, it's it's just so hard to call. As I said, you know, mm. every game between those top three teams has come down to the wire. It's been a one goal game. I expect it to be exactly like that in, in the final. And I think for Nantes, potentially bigger deal because they they're the ones that are maybe just outside the league. You know, it's still everything to play for. But you know, even that one point deficit, they they seem to be for the whole season. They've been the third team in the league. Um, and maybe that, that cup will be the, the big, big thing for them. 
But I mean, what a season though for the domestic leagues when you really look at it. I mean, probably one of the best Bundesliga seasons we've seen in a really, really long time. It's so tight, so hard to call still. The French league being absolutely incredible. That's two, that's two of the top leagues there. And then even outside outside of Barcelona, crushing in Asobal, the rest of the league in Asobal is still really, really tight and it's still still a lot to play for there for those other positions. So for domestic handball, it's been, uh, it's been quite the season. Just to add, I think the Danish league is completely wide open. Um, Alborg haven't been incredible gay gay have been incredible but also you know they're they're already losing points in the in the playoffs reba eschberg equalized turned over a six goal deficit in like the fi- last five minutes to get a point off all board so denmark's wide open and just a underrated league but portugal has been great this season because um, obviously the top three teams have been battling it out, uh, Benfica, Porto, and, um, and Sporting, but Algas Santos, who were actually in the European League earlier, uh, have taken some points off the teams and Braga have been decent. So the Portuguese league is developing as well. So it's, you know, there's some great league handball going on. As I said at the top of the hour, we have a very special guest today on the podcast, and myself and Chris will sat down virtually with uh, Javi Sabate of Płock to talk about their road to the to the quarterfinals against SC Magdeburg, the season they had, how they just squeaked out of the or squeezed out of the the group phase, and then pulled off that big shock against Nantes. Top of the Polish league, things are really looking really good for for Javi and Co. So let's hear what he had to say to us. Hello, hello. How are you, Chavi? Good. No, I'm here in the office a long time ago. Okay. okay. So, well, thanks for joining us. Top of the Polish League in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. At the start of the season, if we said that to you, would you have been very happy with the season so far? Without any question. But, but not, that, not, uh, not only in the beginning of the season, especially uh, from October that we had several injuries, especially in the playmaker position. Uh where uh, it's, it's, it's amazing no? because we have five players in this position and four were, were injured so we had a difficult difficult let's say uh, time but well the sport is, is like it's like that so but I think that after the break uh, the Christmas break and after that we recover um, uh, Nico Mendegui and Fazekas. I think that the, the, the and after half year, of course, of work, especially for the new players, the team is absolutely uh, another one. No, but this is uh, every season is the same. No, uh, it's not important how you are in the beginning. The important is how you arrived to the last two months and a half, three months. Yeah, because if you go back to even the end of the group phase and how close. The team was through elimination. I think a lot of people have already forgotten about that. You know, you you clawed your way into the knockout rounds and then uh, managing to to score that win over Nantes already makes people forget about everything that has gone before. I think maybe that's an interesting way to think about the sport in general, but at least at the moment, it's uh, worked out positively for the team. Well, I think that we are we are realistic. We we have our our goals before the start of the season. Um, this is our first season after two years of break uh, in Champions League. Uh, Champions League is very tough. The, the most of the best teams are are playing Champions League. Most of the best players in the world are playing Champions League. Everything is so equal, and uh, our. I cannot say our goal, our illusion, it was to go to the next stage. But knowing that this is in the first season is something really, really difficult. We have uh, players with some experience or with a lot of experience in Champions League, but we have also a lot of young guys that they don't have this experience in um, in Champions League. And uh, this experience is crucial. No? When, when the matches are decided uh, by one goal, one, two goals, uh, and one goal can make, can make the difference of everything, absolutely everything, the experience is is so so important. It's, it's key, and um, well, I think that we manage uh, in a good way uh, to to especially from in the beginning of the season where we were all the, all the team, and uh, and after uh, from from February, I think that the team uh, grow a lot. I think that we took the the fruits of. Uh, 
of all the work that we did in the first six months, the first part of the season. And uh, I think that it was clear that also our players learn, improve, and uh, they they get also this experience that is necessary in, in Champions League. And from a, from a coaching perspective, obviously you gained a lot of great experience in the European League as a group last season. And this season in the Champions League, What's it been like from for you as a coach? What are some of the differences you noticed of coaching in the Champions League versus the European League? Well, I must say that the European League is fantastic uh, competition. This is the first, no? It's fantastic uh, competition where where is is very equal. But it's true that, for example, in in Champions League, um, there are more teams with the top quality. No, uh, then every match is. It's like the, the the top match that you play in a European league, uh, and this means that your 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 level of preparation um, must be two hundred percent always. They are not one easy match. All the matches are are really tough, and you must prepare uh, really uh, really good. Um, and this for me is the the, the, the huge difference between uh, between both competitions. Sometimes in European league, maybe uh, you can be better than than another team okay and uh, this means that okay so you 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 can uh, prepare the you can plan your team in a different way in champions league no way no way i think that the, the level is so equal or you play even like in our case against top teams in, in europe teams that are are, are better than us uh, but well we try to to compete and uh, this is a sport and in one match everything is is possible no i think that we have also Good level. I, I think that we are showing this, and uh, and we show that we can we can beat absolutely to to everyone in one match. And I think that that showed really well over the two games against Nantes as well in the uh, in the playoff. Can you take us back to that second game against Nantes because it seemed like at various points in the evening you had these challenges as a team to overcome. Nantes going ahead early in the game and looking quite comfortable. You pegged them back. Uh, in the second half, you take a bit of control. You have that two-goal lead in the last minute, lose that, and then have to get yourselves back up again and mentally straight for the penalty shootout. Uh, a lot of challenges, not just for the players, but also for the the whole staff. Yes, I think that uh, the eliminatory, the 120 minutes, uh, our goal it was, of course, to 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 arrive to to try to go to the next uh, round, of course. Uh, we knew that it would be very difficult because Nantes is a um, really good team with really good players. Um, the first goal it was to 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 play here at home and to have to go to Nantes with with options to be there and uh, there in Nantes uh, we draw the first match. So that means that our uh, our goal uh, that is to 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 continue alive in the competition uh, it was it was achieved and uh, in the second match. Our goal it was to, to arrive to the, to the last ten minutes with with options in the game and to to see what is going on. No, I think that when you you play, uh, we were not the favourites. Nantes was the, the favourite team, clear. And uh, I think that when you are favourite and uh, the the result is like this, and you play at home with full arena, fantastic atmosphere in Nantes, yeah. I think that the pressure is is big. No, I I know this because of. I can say this because of experience also, no, and uh, and I think that uh, our guys uh, play really good with with this uh, mentality, with this situation. Also, I think that we are using all these years. I think that the team uh, grow a lot in the European League uh, mentally, and that uh, in this aspect, I think that that uh, did that our players uh, grow also on the field. Uh, that we have better players. I think that the mental aspect is is so important in the in the top level sport. And I think that we we um, the European League, without any question, uh, it was key moment in our in our club to to realize that we can compete against some of the of the best clubs. Also, because like I told you before, no, I, we in European League there are really good teams. We play in the last uh, two years against GOG, Fuchs, Loven. Uh, Magdeburg, Lemgo, Cadete Schaffhausen, so I, I, Benfica, so I mean Sporting, so there are really good levels. So uh, I think that that to to realize that we can compete against this kind of teams, um, it was very important to, to 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 realize that we we can be also inside these best teams in the in Europe, no? And I think that this season we uh, the team is showing that. 
you as a coach, obviously, I think um, it's extremely important how you set your players up for a shootout like that, um, the mental side of the game. So what's your approach when you know the shootout's coming up? What kind of what kind of tone do you try to set with the group when you have them in a huddle? Well, I think that uh, this is one work of uh, many years. No, uh, This is my fifth season here. I think that we change um, a lot. And uh, but especially, I think that the that we our our mentality is always uh, go match by match. Not not we are not uh, looking for uh, or thinking in, in in the match of after three weeks. Um, we try to fight always sixty minutes because we know that. Also because because of experience, no. I think that this is the most important, no. That that uh, the matches in some periods one team is better and after each another one is the other. So so and at the end the most important is who is better at the end of the sixty minutes, no. When finish the match, not who is better uh, forty minutes or fifty or fifty nine. So I think that we during all this period, all these years, we turn a lot of uh, results. Also, we lost some matches. So also it's important to learn from the defeats, and um, and I think that we have uh, really really professional players with really strong mentality and um, that leave it all these things that I'm talking about. And uh, we really believe that when the match is not good, so we must continue uh, working because uh, the, the 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 matches are turning. No, it's, it's impossible to lead uh, 60 minutes and be better of the other team 60 minutes in, in, in this level. This is no 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 way, no chance. So I think that we really believe in this. We know this. And um, and uh, that's why I think that uh, our players are fighting always 60 minutes. So it was easy then setting up the team for the penalty shootout because on paper it looked very good. Like well, say, it, it was it was not easy, no, because you know that the, the seven meters, I cannot say that it's luck because this is part of the game, no, the, the shooting of seven meters. But, um, well, I think that uh, we were quiet. Uh, also, the, the, the pressure, it was not, not for us. And, uh, but also, it's a little luck, no? Because at the end, one, one save, it was the difference, no? One save of Nacho Bioska was the, absolutely the difference. So, uh, both teams could go to the next stage. And uh, we were lucky also, and uh, we are there. We're heading into the quarterfinal then against Magdeburg. You you faced them before in the European League. So uh, of course both teams have developed quite a lot then. Um without giving too much away to us in terms of tactics and game plans, how do you think or what do you think one of the key areas will be to to match them or maybe uh, uh to dictate the pace because it feels like that is going to be very important over the 120 minutes against them. Well, I think that will be very tough for us, no? Very tough because we are talking about one of the best teams in the in the world at the, in this moment, no? One of the teams that is is uh, fighting to 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 get the Bundesliga, uh, to to one of the favorites to stay in final four. After in final four, also the history says that there everything is possible, um, and one top team, no? I think that uh, can be a lot of factors that decide, no? It's clear that for us. For us, I cannot speak uh, nothing about the defense or the fastback or the attack or the balance. I cannot say nothing about that because I think that um, uh, they are uh, really, really good. Uh, that to, 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 for us, uh, we must play absolutely perfect match in, in all the aspects uh, to, to, to try to, to, to go to the next stage. No? You, you must play 120 minutes really good. Um, Magdeburg is a team that if you have uh, some period, bad period, they they destroy you, no. And uh, uh, in this in this level, when you get a big advantage or four or five goals difference, they know how to manage really well, no. They have uh, players with a lot of experience, a lot of quality, and uh, well, so our goal will be to 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 try to that they don't go to uh, that they don't take this this advantage, no. Will be will be difficult, we know. But like I say, we are um, we are not the favourites. They are the favourites, and for us, it's absolutely any any pressure. A lot of neutrals like to watch Magdeburg for the style of handball that they play. This this kind of small small man handball, really quick, one against one, very fast. Is that something you also can appreciate? Is something that you like their style of play as well? Well, I think that every every team plays according to the characteristics of the. Of their players, no. I think that they, they play like this because they have uh, this kind of players. 
and uh, they are re really making a really good job. Uh, we uh, we see this in the last uh, probably two, three, four years. How Magdeburg, I think, that uh, gave two, three steps forward. Uh, is, 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 they are playing really good. They have, uh, in my opinion, a uh, very compact uh, team with uh, some players in really good shape and uh, may, probably uh, top players today in the in the world. And well, so so it's, it's, it's nice to to see them uh, how how they play. No, they are managing very well, and uh, we can see this in Bundesliga, in Champions League. So, and it's impressive how how they can keep um, this intensity, this level during all the during all the season. No, this is because uh, their kind of of game is uh, fast and uh, so direct uh, with a lot of contact and. Um, well, it's, it's really impressive how they they can uh, keep this level absolutely during all the season. You mentioned that the style of play reflecting the players, and it's interesting to see uh, Płock's development as well over the last few years. As you said, you've been with the team for five years. I remember the last time I saw you in person was literally just before COVID ruined handball for that season. It was in uh, Irun as uh, in your last Champions League season and everything looked like it was going to be uh, yeah, a, a good run into the, the knockout rounds in the end. That didn't happen because of COVID. But also the team has changed a lot in the last few years since then. It feels like you've you've had time to, to shape the team uh, quite a bit. How has that journey been for you being with the club for the last five years and, and leaving your mark on the team and, and bringing in the players that, that you felt were right? Well, I think that first of all, uh, to, it's clear that when you have more time to to work, so um, you can uh, uh, bring more your ideas to to the team, no, and to the club. Um, when I arrived here, I didn't know how that I I, I would be as as long, no. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think that uh, the the management had clear that uh, it's necessary some some time. Yeah, some patient and I think that uh, it was really good and it was working I think that that um, from my last from my first season are only three players so it's normal to go changing players coaches in the in the teams uh this that's a sport uh but uh, we changed a lot of uh, a lot of players I think that uh to the mix of uh, experienced players with young players is very good because because the experienced players like can be, for example, Terzic Krajewski, uh, Nico Mindeguia, uh, they they brought us uh, a lot of experience, a lot of uh, one example how to be professional of motivation. And that was really important for me. And that was one idea, not only because of the quality of the players, also because of, 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 of that they teach or that they, they are example for the young ones to how to behave uh, inside the court and outside the court. And uh, that was huge difference for us, huge difference to, to, to learn with the time uh, for everyone, uh, how 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 be focused in, in, in the sport, uh, how to develop. And uh, because like this, it's much easier to, to improve, no? I think that um, that was really, really important. And of course, with the time, always is, is easier. You have more players uh, that they control the system, uh, that they are inside inside the system, who who are more example for the new ones, and and everything is is, is easier. It's like one uh, ball that every every time is bigger, no, and better, no. And um, but at the end is uh, time question. And in this in this aspect, I think that the the patience of the club also it was uh, really important. And you talked about the mix between young and experienced players. I almost said older players there for a second, but experienced players. Uh, and one of your big talents this season, and I think a lot of people enjoy watching him, is Tin Lucin. He's 23, obviously top. He's in the top 10 scorers of the Champions League as well, but uh, pushing on 80 goals at this stage. What's it like, firstly, to work with a player like Tin? And secondly, where do you think his future is heading? Well, for me, it's a, pl a pleasure to, and I feel really, really happy and uh, lucky that I have the chance to to work absolutely with this team and all these players every day. So I 
I, uh, humble is my passion and uh, to 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 join them uh, for me is uh, is a privilege no uh, in the case of Tim Luchin is is a player who developed a lot uh, in in the time that is here uh, like another ones uh, but is uh, is very complete player uh, attack defense is one uh, player very competitive very professional um, has clear ideas and uh, I think that he has uh, he's very young like you said and he still he has long long uh, career no where he can arrive so I don't know I hope that he will continue here in plots a lot of years uh, but this is a player uh, who has um, huge potential uh, who who improved it a lot in this almost two years that is here and uh, well we'll see where is the the limit no in this moment uh, we are lucky that he's here and we are enjoying uh, enjoying him and uh, also I think that is good for him because he's he's developing a, a lot no to stay here uh, Brian is a big fan of Tim Luchin over the last couple of years so. <laughs> uh, yeah. and uh, we want to ask you about the the team for next season as well because something we always find quite funny in the handball world because it's it can be hard to verify sometimes some of the players that are joining for the following season and uh, particularly through Wikipedia which can either be perfect information or complete nonsense and uh, we were looking at the uh, the supposed transfers uh, some of which I think are set uh, the likes of uh, Mirko and, and Zara Betts for next season but uh, you've also been linked with uh, Peter Nanadic. is there anything you can tell us about that? Well, no, I, I can say openly everything. No, uh, I think that we must be we must be realistic. No, I think um, we are we are a club that um, that we are growing, okay, step by step. Uh, I think that in this aspect, the, the management is very serious, uh, knows what is possible and what is not possible, uh, and there are one big commitment with the players and uh, the families, like most of the clubs. No, I mean uh, that is possible is possible, and that is not possible is not possible. So we are growing. I think that the the future is is really good. Is really good, but um, we have the feet on the ground. So uh, we would like to have uh, Noid Laszlo, eh? but uh, <laughs> but it's not possible. Yes. But it's not possible. So, in this case, uh, Peter Nedic is fantastic player, fantastic player. But uh, in this moment, especially in the middle of the season, this is far of our our reality today. You recently took up uh, the double role as a Czech national coach as well as your or as being the the Płock head coach. First of all, how's how's that been for the first few games? You got a big result against against Iceland and. Were there any people or any concerns from people who thought maybe that you might be a bit distracted as national team coach and Pots coach? And how do you manage both of those jobs? Well, first of all, uh, I'm really happy that I can be the Viswa Pots uh, coach and uh, Czech national team coach. Eh? Uh, second, look, uh, I have experience already to, to, to be a coach of, in a club when it was in Vesprem and in national team with Hungary. So I know very well what is what is going on and um, I know how absolutely different it is to be a coach in the club and in the, in the national team. Absolutely different, nothing nothing in common. Uh, and if I do this, it's because I know that I can do it. If not, I wouldn't make it. I can do it uh, well in both sides, no? And that both sides can be, uh, can take advantage of this situation also. I'm a a uh, really op- uh, honest uh, person and never I will make something that I think that uh, uh, can be bad uh, for me or for, for the other side, no? Um, look, uh, I'm really happy to, to to be the coach there. Also, I think that the group of, of players is is amazing. It's amazing. There also, I think the Federation also has uh, the, the, the foot on the ground clear ideas, realistic uh, idea. Uh, we know that uh, we must grow a lot. We want to grow a lot. I think that they are making a really good job, really good job, especially with young players. Um, I, I think that after one year, in my opinion, 
I think that uh, we are growing. Uh, we we think that in one match also it's possible to surprise to to everyone. Like it was, for example, with Iceland, that is great team in my opinion, top six in the world in my opinion. Uh, but also it's true that in this moment, for example, in one for one long championship like can be one euro or one world championship, this is absolutely different. No, when you play two matches per day. Um, well, because we we need uh, more players with experience, because we need uh, more quality players to make rotation. It's not the the the, the same to play one match uh, every three months that to to play every two days, no. Um, and in this aspect, so well, so we are working to try to improve, to try to to put more players inside the national team, to to get players with more experience, because we know that to grow, we we need more more players in in that sense, no. Also, as a coach of a, the national team as well, I know players hate to be training during the national team camps when they're not involved with the national teams at home while doing the hard training. So I guess it's nice to also be involved in the coaching side and not have to be the bad guy. Well, uh, listen, <laughs> of course, everybody wants to go to to national team. No, this this is clear. Eh? And this is so good because they are everybody showed the ambition to 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 be a national team. There are players that they decide already maybe to don't go to national team because of age uh, or because of other reasons. Um, but I don't think that is the, the bad one because I really, I think that the, the trainings in this period is, are uh, uh, quite different. Okay. And, uh, but uh, also from my perspective, in my personal opinion, for me also one of the, one of the reasons that I wanted to be in national team because is because because I really like uh, and I need this 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 experience that already I had with Hungary, and I really like it and uh, I want to to participate because my goal is to try to improve every day and I know that the, this this role I like I told you is absolutely different but also uh, can 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 give me something to to improve like a coach no and. Uh, I try to to give my my best to the to the players, but also I know that I must continue learning and and improving, and that was my my uh, really wish. Uh, that's why I wanted to to be also coaching national team. Thank you so much. Uh, you. Good luck for the final qualification games, and then for the big games against Magdeburg as well. A very exciting month or two to come for you. Take care. Thank you so much, Thank guys. You. Have a nice uh, Sunday. Thank you. Take care. Thank bye. Thank bye. You. Bye. 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 Thank you to Xavi Sabate. And yes, this is Chris's voice. At the very beginning of the podcast, Alex and Brian promised no me, but here I am. Not just in the interview, but at the end of the podcast as well. Because since that recording, quite a lot has happened, particularly on tuesday night and we couldn't publish without going over it just briefly alex and i were on a call here on thursday so alex what do you want to talk about well we have to start with one of the biggest upsets in european club handball history i'm gonna go all that way yeah because who had flensburg getting destroyed at home by granny years no one not a single soul not could have believed that a single soul it was just just incredible so uh the first leg between flensburg and granny years was a really close match flensburg won by one goal in the end and it looked like you know this was granny years best effort it was we all kind of clapped them on the back talked about you know actually league as well is not a bad league you know, there's some good teams here, but we all know what's going to happen in the second leg. And what happened in the second leg Holy blew shit. my mind and I think blew the humble world's mind. The match finished 35-27 to Granier's, and that is a flattering score for Flensburg. Mm-hmm. At one stage, Granier's were up to 12 goals ahead and just dominated, dominated this Flensburg team who's been unbelievable uh, over the last couple of months. They've got all their players back. They're finally fit. And 38-year-old Antonio Garcia and 19-year-old Nigerian Yusuf Farouk 
are the players who tear them apart. Yusuf Farouk. Ah, finally we have a good excuse to get him on the podcast. A player that we've had our eye on for a long time. Now we have to get that done. Uh, (laughs) For the first time since the implementation of the EHF or EHF Cup Finals in 2013, the hosts will not be participating. This has been a weird little side note in every single final weekend of this second tier competition for the men. The fact that in the old days, if you were the host, you got to skip the quarterfinals and go straight into the final weekend since the uh, reformatting of the competition as the European League a couple of seasons ago. It was changed to that team had to go all the way. But Flensburg were, as you said, in everyone's mind, just like dead cert to be there. Maybe even just to go and win the whole thing. A Champions League team, you know, knocking about here in the European League. There's an obvious explanation to this, and that goes back to the fact that they had to play two games in 24 hours in the German Cup. And then less than 48 hours later had to play a third game. So three games in four days. But is that enough of an explanation? Absolutely. I, I really think that was uh, really key. And you and like on the other side, Granier's were really up for it. So uh, it, let's not take away anything from mm. the Spanish team here. They were fired up. They were diving for every loose ball. They were just like fired up the whole game. And that met this Flensburg team that was clearly tired. You know, playing three games in four days at, you know, really high level games. There's no, no minutes to rest across the, the German Cup mm-hmm. or, or this game. And it, it kind of, there's this intersection of energy that completely benefit Granier's. And it really, there's a moment in, uh, towards, the middle of the second half where I could see just how gone Flensburg were. And it's, it was a very small moment, but, you know, Granier's were sprinting ahead. I think they got up to like seven goals ahead. And this is the moment where, you know, the other team should be really focused and really getting itself together. They conceded a goal. Burridge kind of stumbled back into the goal, threw a pass into the middle, which Gala didn't catch. The ball bounced in the se- into the Granier's half and then they kind of all trotted together and took the tip off. You know, that is mm-hmm. that that can only be pure fatigue and not only um physical fatigue, but also mental fatigue. You know, it takes takes a lot to play at the highest level three three games in four four days. And it just comes down to like huge criticism has to go down to the German Cup. What is the point of having a bronze medal game. Like, question. obviously, Very good obviously question. money is the answer here because it's in the Langsas Arena. It's a full stadium. You want the fans to stay around. And I think this comes down to the, a classic don't play the players. Like, this is ridiculous. The, the benefit of getting that third place, uh, the bronze medal in the cup, is you skip an early round next season. That's nothing. Like, it's a waste mm. of time. You skip an early round against the fourth division <laughs> German team or something. It's, it's a, uh, and yeah. that, that caused the downfall of Flensburg in this game. But again, Antonio Garcia, Yusuf Farouk, absolutely incredible. And Yusuf Farouk came out with some of the most unbelievable plays I've oh, seen this season. Oh, tasty. Tasty the- handball from the Nigerian. Love it. Two in particular. One is the standing shot, the kind of mm-hmm. not even underarm, kind of mid arm shot that just rocketed into the net, and you could you could hear the net reverberate, which was just like it's a classic feeling where the the arena is so silent as well. Mm. Six thousand five hundred fans <laughs> were so silent that you could see the shot, you could hear the shot rocketing into the net. And then the other one was actually in the first half where he faked that shot which dropped Simon Held, who went down for the block, and it also dropped Burridge in the goals. Yeah. And he just took two steps and just placed it into the goal. That was It was just incredible. Yeah. 
Gorgeous handball, like also with some of the assists he was giving. It wasn't just about the shooting. But that's the first time this season in the European League he's gone into double digits. Ten goals for the first time. And it was nine, nine goals in the end. Ten goals according to the HF. That's oh, what nine goals according to other sources. Uh, ten goals according to the goals. HF. That's, uh, we'll give him ten goals. <laughs> well, yeah, let's stick to that. The first time he's got, <laughs> he's got ten. And uh, you know what? I'll give him ten based on that but yeah he just looked so confident and the way he was whipping the ball around it uh he was it was his day and uh yeah i bet kielsa will be excited to get him back next season now <laughs> another one of the players on the books it, it's great to see him uh actually get this chance you know he, he came over and we will definitely get him um on the podcast at some stage because he has a very fascinating backstory um just being a talent from Nigeria, passed around uh, clubs and agents, but ultimately ending up with Kielsa, where I think it's a good club to be just taken into Europe with and given this opportunity in ground years in a, in a good league, in a good team, but also getting the opportunity to play constantly. And it's showing now. Yeah. So um, great stuff from him. And then just a little side note for... Um, his fellow 19-year-old in the backcourt, Masana, who got five goals in that game, but a backcourt of 19-year-old, 19-year-old, and 38-year-old were <laughs> was the Granier's uh, victory yeah. cigar there. The semi-final draw has been made. Granier against Guppingen, Montpellier against Fuxa. I think that's the perfect combo. You know? That's, that's great. great. Uh, you said earlier in this podcast, I know you have to leave in like two minutes, so you said earlier in this podcast, a few days ago, you had Montpellier as the favourites to win the European League. Do you still believe that? I still believe it. Montpellier are a top, top team. And I think I, I would have seen Flensburg as their biggest rival. They're out now. Fuchs of Berlin were really good, but I, I was about to say that they're going to be in the depths of a Bundesliga title race. But, you know, the same thing's happening in France. Um, mm -hmm. But we did think that it was Cadet and Schaffhausen that was going to be the big story of this round who beat uh, Fuchs of 37-33 in the first leg. And really, for 50 minutes in that second leg, they stuck together. They uh, with, with just 10 minutes to go, it was 25-23 uh, to Fuchs of Berlin, which meant Cadet and were still two goals ahead on goal difference. And then Matthias Gitzel just took over. He missed the first leg, which uh, I think caused this Cadetan team to, uh, which allowed this Cadetan team to, to take that big lead. But, you know, the big boy was back and he <laughs> came in with a performance that, you know, I've, I've kind of been waiting for with Gitzel, you know, in the big game. But this one was 10 goals, three assists. And in those last five minutes, the last four goals, which basically clinched the victory and the tie for Fixer Berlin was Matthias Gitzel goal, Matthias Gitzel goal, Matthias Gitzel goal, Matthias Gitzel assist. Game Can't over. Can't ask for much more. <laughs> Can't ask for much more than that. But uh, yeah, we have to give props to this cadet and team and uh, their coach, Adel Schein Eilson, who uh, Slein Dick manager who's come over and really brought this team together, put in a great system, brought in some experienced heads, and it, it seems to be working. And, you know, hopefully we see the Swiss league on the up uh, over the next couple of years. And there's a bit of a bit of a title race there as well. Uh, some good teams playing in Switzerland. So, Tony Girona, if you're listening, you know, the Swiss, Swiss league is on the up. <laughs> yeah, making a shout for maybe an outside bet of a... Champions League spot next season, but uh, no European League glory for them this time. All right, I think uh, you have to go to a meeting, Alex. I do. I'm going to settle in. Just got home. We'll talk to you in the next podcast. Until then, from all of us, goodbye. Goodbye.